Welcome back, everybody. This is Days of Noah number 48, and it makes the third lecture in a row of the Bible Prophecy series. I was going to try and keep these separated, but there tends to be a lot of overlap between the Days of Noah videos and Bible Prophecy, and so ultimately I just decided to combine these two topics together. So today, it's going to be an interesting uh, lecture today. We're going to look at some a lot of uh, verses from the book of revelations things that have to do with the bottomless pit and i think it'll be a very interesting lecture before we do i want to go back and do a little review from the previous lectures we were looking at a multitude of verses from the gospels matthew 24 mark 13 and luke 21 we were comparing those to revelation 6 and isaiah 13 and second thessalonians 2 all of these verses are pertaining to the day of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, as I've said in the past, and as the scripture says, we see through the glass half dimly. And, you know, I, I, I have listened to different people in the past who they make claims that they have prophetic gifting and the Lord told them specifically how things are going to happen, and they're very specific about the things that they pronounce. That's not how I operate at this time in my life. Um, I know that human error can enter in. I know that human biases can enter in. When you study Bible prophecy and you read commentaries from many other people over the course of many years, um, false doctrines can be entered in and so you know this is not me saying thus says the lord this is exactly how it's going to go down this is my opinion based on bible study and a lot of research and prayer all combined this is where i believe the lord has led me in my own personal walk and discernment and i'm sharing that with the listeners it's up to you to take it to the Lord, do your own studies, and come to your own conclusion about how you feel about these prophecies specifically. And so today we're going to just quickly hit Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, notice it's after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, I've come to a place in my walk where I take these as literal verses. Just for the heck of it, I decided to go back and, and do a literature search and look at some of the commentaries from many of the great Bible commentary people out there over the last couple hundred years, and every single one I looked at felt that these were all metaphorical. They didn't believe that the sun was literally going to be turned to dark, the moon wouldn't give her light, and the stars were falling from heaven. They thought that this was all allegory. And so that's always been the great argument about the book of Revelations. Are we dealing with allegory and metaphors and parables, or is it literal? Well, I believe that the majority of it is literal. And I will try and explain that as we proceed forward. But verse 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, I don't believe that that's allegorical. I believe that we're going to literally see Jesus Christ coming back on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And if that's literal, then there's no reason to think that the preceding verse about the sun, the moon, and the stars is literal also. Verse 31 goes on to say, And he'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That's obviously the rapture of the bride of Christ, the catching away of the church to meet Jesus in the air. Now, I don't believe that that's allegorical either. I take verse 31 to be a literal verse. Jesus Christ is going to come back the second advent, the parousia, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Just That's what the book of Revelations means. 
This is the apocalypse, which means the unveiling of the return of the Lord. And he's going to send out his angels, and with the great sound of a trumpet, he's going to gather together his elect. So I believe all of this is literal. Now, if you look at Mark 13, it's almost identical verbiage. So we're going to skip over to Luke 21. Luke 21 is the same account, a little bit different story from Luke. There'll be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. He doesn't tell us that the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven. He just tells us that there's going to be signs in all of those things. I take that to be literal. And upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. That means that the nations are going to be puzzled with what's going on. The sea and the waves will be roaring. That means that there be the oceans are going to be volatile. There's going to be natural disasters, tsunamis, etc. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So now we know that men's hearts will fail them. Something is going to be coming upon the earth that's going to be so supernatural. So cosmological, the powers of the heavens, that word heaven is the Uranus, the starry abode, you know, the atmosphere, the up, up in the sky, things are going to be shaken and coming upon the earth that are going to make men literally have heart attacks and die. That's what men's hearts failing them for fear. And then they're going to see the sign of the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and it's when these things begin to come to pass that we the bride of christ should look up for our redemption draweth nigh that verse correlates with up here verse 31 that he's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they're going to gather together his elect when they go to gather the elect the elect are going to be aware that the time is coming and they're going to look up because they know that they're getting ready to be raptured to be with the Lord. Now, I said in the last lecture that I believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in these particular accounts lines up with Revelation 6. We know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first half of those prophecies, as I said in previous lectures, is specifically about the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., and the abomination of desolation that we looked at in the last lecture. Those are very important lectures that build upon this particular lecture. Now, the second half of Matthew, Mark, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are dealing with the second set of questions that we reviewed last time. What will be the sign of the end of the age and of your return? This is the second advent of Jesus. And so, Obviously, when Matthew, Mark, and Luke are talking about the second coming of Jesus, that pertains to the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what John wrote about in the book of Revelations. So it makes sense that these verses in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 would correlate with Revelation 6. And as a matter of fact, they do. Revelation 6, 12 says, I looked when he, that is Jesus, opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Now once again, I believe these are literal. Most Bible commentary for most of these professional pastors and commentary folks, they believe that this is all allegorical, all spiritual, and all metaphorical. But I take a literal stance that when Jesus cracks the sixth seal, these events are going to happen. And these correlate with what we saw above. That when the sun is when Matthew 24 says that the sun will be darkened. Down here, we see in Revelation 6, the sun became a sackcloth of hair. That means it became black. And then up above, when it says the moon shall not give her light, down here we're told that the moon became like blood. It was darkened like blood. Now, 
the moon just reflects the light of the sun. So if the sun becomes blackened, then the moon cannot shine the sun's light. And in this particular verse, we're told that it's going to turn like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth. And it gives the analogy of the fig tree. The same way if you see a mighty storm hit a fig tree and it knocks the figs off the tree and they fall straight to the ground, that's what's going to happen in the sixth seal, that there are going to be stars that fall from heaven and hit the earth. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. Now, the question is, what causes the great earthquake? I would said in the previous lecture that possibly these stars falling from heaven and hitting the earth may be what causes the great earthquake. And that's a theory. I don't know that to be true. It may just be that when Jesus cracks open the sixth seal, boom, an earthquake happens. A great earthquake all across the planet happens as the fault lines are opened up. Um, but I had theorized that this is possibly due to these stars falling from heaven as a fig tree drops when the wind is shaken. Now, comparing Revelation 6 to Isaiah 34, Isaiah also is talking about the day of the Lord, particularly the second coming of Christ. And he says that all the hosts of heaven are going to be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. That's exactly what John said right here. The sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up. Then Isaiah goes on to say, and all the host shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as a fruit falls from a fig tree. That would be the fig falling from the fig tree. Notice how Isaiah, 800 years before the first coming of Christ, makes the analogy of the fig falling from the fig tree the same way that John talks about a fig falling from the fig tree right here in Revelation 6. And by the way, also later in Matthew 24, Matthew makes the analogy of the fig tree as well. So that's all consistent that we're talking about the same event, the day of the Lord. Now, continuing in Isaiah 13, we're told, behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. That's exactly what Matthew, Mark, and Luke said above, and that's exactly what John said in Revelations. Every single commentary that I read said Isaiah 13 here is allegorical just as they said the others are above are allegorical. But in my opinion, this is literal, and I'll tell you why. This verse, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light, Isaiah goes out of his way to say, and their constellations. That word specifically means to the constellations in space, and it lists off Orion as an example. So how can this be allegory when Isaiah is giving us a specific example of Orion as a constellation? Therefore, if the stars of heaven and their constellations do not give their light, and he, and he uses Orion as an example, that is a literal prophecy. That means that the sun being darkened is a literal prophecy. The moon not shining its light is a literal prophecy. And so I believe all of these verses up here are talking about the same last day's events, and it's literal. As is verse 13 here where it says, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts. Well, up here in Revelation 6, we were told that every mountain and every island was going to be moved out of its place. This is from this great worldwide earthquake that's going to shake everything on the planet. And so, again, it's a possibility that one of these stars, when it hits the earth, shakes the earth out of its place. 
There's other areas where Isaiah makes the reference that the, that the earth is going to stagger to and fro like a drunkard would stagger when they're drunk. And so the same way that when you strike a pool ball on a pool table and it hits the eight ball and, and moves it out of its place, the earth is going to move out of its rotational orbit at some point during Revelations. Now just to corroborate this idea that it's literal, we see this word constellations being in a, used in a couple other places. In Job 9, Job's talking about multiple constellations. He says, which maketh Arcturus, the star system Arcturus, in the strongest concordance is known as the Great Bear or Ursa Major. He goes on to talk about Orion, that is the same word used up in here in Isaiah 13. And then he mentions the Pleiades, a constellation of seven stars. And then later in Job 38, can you bind the sweet influence of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth the Maseroth in their season? The word Maseroth is the 12 Hebrew signs of the Zodiac and the 36 associated constellations. In these verses, they're talking about Orion. It's the same Orion here in Isaiah 13 when he talks about the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, and the heavens being shaken and fallen to the earth. So, as you can see, these are literal events referring to a literal sun, the literal moon, the literal constellations, and the literal stars in heaven. Now, I also want to quickly review the rapture verses so that we can have a better understanding of where this is. And again, I can't be 100% sure exactly where in the book of Revelation this takes place. I believe it takes place somewhere between the opening of the sixth and seventh seal, as we'll review in a moment. So in Matthew 24, it talks about, As the lightning cometh out of the east and shine to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That means that when Jesus comes, it's going to be like lightning that comes out of the east. Everybody on the planet's going to be able to see that event happening. Then he goes on to say, The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they're going to see this event happening. That means every nation. And they will see, see there, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The second coming and the second advent of Jesus is going to be so magnificent that everybody on the planet at that time is going to see it coming, those events that are happening. And then he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's very important. Angels, trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That obviously has to be the rapture. We know that the rapture event is when Jesus comes back to gather his church. So therefore, logically speaking, that has to be the rapture of the church. Now, Paul has something to say about this in 1 Corinthians 15. Now this I say, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. What does he mean by that? He means that we are all in a fallen, contaminated body. Our body is a sinful, fleshly body that fell during the fall of Adam in the garden. We inherited that corruption, the law of sin and death. And these corrupted bodies cannot go to heaven. And so God's going to have to deal with these corrupted flesh and blood bodies by changing them into incorruptible, glorified bodies. And this is what Paul is saying, that these flesh and blood bodies cannot inherit the kingdom and these corrupted bodies that are dying every day cannot inherit incorruption. So behold... I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So we're all going to be changed. That is the dead in Christ and the living in Christ in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's a millisecond. 
in the twinkling of an eye, that's as fast as you can blink, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That means when the angel comes down up here above, and he starts blowing on the trumpet, he's going to be there. Are going to be multiple trumpet sounds, and at the last, the very last trumpet sound, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That means the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected from the dead, and they're going to be resurrected into literal glorified bodies for this corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality they're going to be immortal bodies and all of those who are living are going to be converted from their living mortal body into an immortal body verse 54 th th therefore they will be able to br uh, bring about this saying which is written Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So Paul's talking about this prophecy that's still yet to happen at the time of the rapture. He expounds on that even more in 1 Thessalonians 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those which are asleep, that you should not sorrow as others who do not hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. What is Paul talking about here? Back in Paul's days, the brothers and sisters in Christ who had already lost many brothers and sisters during the times of persecution under the people like Nero and many of the other persecutors of that day, they were very concerned that their brothers and sisters in Christ had already died. They knew Jesus was coming back someday, and they were concerned that the brothers and sisters who had died were not going to be able to experience the return of Christ because they were dead. And Paul is saying, look, I don't want you to be ignorant about this concerning those which are asleep, those are which are dead. And you don't need to be sorryful about those which are dead as if they don't have any hope. Because if we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then guess what? Even so, those also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Who are those who sleep in Jesus? All those who are believers who died. They're asleep in Jesus. He's going to raise them and bring them with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What does that mean? It means that there's going to be a generation of believers that are on the planet in the very last days when Jesus Christ descends down during the second coming in the parousia, the second advent of Christ. But those who are living, that, that faithful generation who are alive, are not going to prevent all those who are dead in Christ from being raised because, verse 16, the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's exactly what it says up here in Matthew 24, that immediately after the tribulation of those days, Jesus is going to come back on the clouds in power and glory. He's going to send out his angels, and with the sound of a great trumpet, he, he's going to gather together his elect, both dead and alive, to be raptured. So down here in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says the same thing. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's called a resurrection of the dead. That event cannot be separated out from the rapture. First comes the resurrection of the dead, like it says right here, and then, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. This is where we get the word rapturo in the Latin, or harpazo, the catching away of the church. So, 
to make that clear, when Jesus comes back in the last days, he's going to shout with the voice of an archangel. He's going to send out all of his angels with the trump of God. And then the dead in Christ are going to be resurrected from the dead first. They're going to be resurrected into glorified bodies. And then that fateful generation of human beings that are living on the planet at that time are going to be in the twinkling of an eye changed into glorified bodies and caught up into the air to meet Jesus in the air so that wherever he goes, we will be with him. Well, where is he going? He's going to meet up with Satan, the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet to have the battle of Armageddon. And we will be there to witness that event. Now Paul continues to expand on this again in the next book, 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brothers, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. This is the same gathering that he spoke about up here in 1 Thessalonians 4. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he talks about our gathering to be with Jesus. First the dead in Christ, then those who are living are going to be caught up in the rapture. Now he's telling us what events have to happen before that rapture. That you soon be shaken in mind or be troubled in spirit by word or by letter as if that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day, that is the gathering of the church to Jesus Christ, for that day shall not come except two things happen first. The falling away of the church, that word is the apostasy, and number two, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That word perdition means the destruction of a human vessel. And he goes on to say that this man of perdition, the, the Antichrist, is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God and all that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember that when I was with you, I told you these things. So these are two prerequisites before the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering to him. The falling away of the church first, and the man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed. Well, how will the Antichrist be revealed? Well, he has to set up his beast system, and he has to issue the mark of the beast so that the world now knows who the Antichrist is. Those are prerequisites for the rapture of the church. And when it says here that the Antichrist is going to exalt himself above all that is called God, so that he, that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. In the next couple of lectures, we're going to look at this more closely. Are we talking about a literal third Solomon's temple that the Freemasons and the Jews in Israel are trying to build? Or are we talking about the New Testament holy temple, which is the human temple, and that this is truly the future abomination of desolation when the Antichrist is able to take over a human temple and when Satan's able to desolate the human temple. And we're going to get into that more as the lectures proceed forward. And now you know what's withholding that he, that is the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity already at work. Only he who now letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed. That's the Antichrist who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his parousia, his second coming. But prior to that, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Before Jesus comes back and destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming, the Antichrist is going to reveal himself through the supernatural working of Satan with all power, lines, signs, and lying wonders. These are pseudo-wonders, false wonders. They're going to be supernatural cosmological events, but they're going to be deceptive false events that the enemy is going to use through 
possibly technology, etc. And we're going to look in the future at what those specifically might be. One of those might be the extraterrestrial movement and the disclosure of, of uh, extraterrestrial entities and spacecraft, etc. The other might be Project Bluebeam, which is the all of the satellites in the World Wide Web that are all connected to give this large hologram in the sky of all these supernatural events. Those are lectures that still lie ahead, God willing. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, they perish because they did not love the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them the strong delusion that they should believe the lie. See, there is a lie that's coming. It's a worldwide lie that's coming after the working of Satan through the power and signs and lying wonders of Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet so that those who believe the lie will be damned and they will perish because they did not love the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. These false signs and, and power and signs and lying wonders line up with Revelation 13 with regards to the first and second beast raining down fire from the heavens and deceiving all of mankind with these signs and lying wonders. See, these things have to happen first before Jesus comes back. That's what prompts Jesus to come back. Satan finally is able to lead mankind to a one world system, a one world currency, the mark of the beast system, the Antichrist takes up reign over the planet, many of the lukewarm church, the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church fall away from God. There's this great apostasy of the church. A lot of them are deceived and take the mark. And then those who are faithful to Jesus Christ, who are willing to give up their life if need be, um, that's when the Lord comes back during that that season and he then uh, gathers his elect together to be with him in the air and then he destroys Satan and the false prophet and, um, and the Antichrist. And actually, specifically, he throws the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire and Satan he, he binds into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Okay, guys, that's pretty much it for the review. It's kind of a long review, but I felt like those are just really important verses. And just to boil it down, there are big cosmological supernatural events coming into the last days. It makes it clear in the scripture that Jesus is going to come back in the last days during the second advent, the parousia, the supernatural unveiling and revelation and apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And it's upon that return that he is going to shout with the archangel of the trumpet. He's going to send out his angels and he's going to rapture the church. But before he raptures the, the living, breathing church on the planet, he's going to resurrect the dead in Christ. And that's all going to happen, boom, boom, in the twinkling of an eye. The dead are risen into a glorified body and resurrected. And then the living are changed into glorified bodies. And simultaneously, they all meet the Lord in the, in the clouds. But those events will not happen until the great falling of the church happens and the man of sin, the Antichrist system is set up and he is revealed as who he is. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's important to understand that in context of this pre-tribulation rapture that a lot of people are subscribing to, that just doesn't jive with scripture on multiple levels. And when you look at the Old Testament, Noah wasn't whisked out of the storm. Noah had to go through the storm. He was preserved while going through it. Daniel had to go into the lion's den. Joseph had to go into prison. The apostles had to meet their fate. And so we are going to have to go into the lion's den too, y'all. And that's where the real faith and trust in Christ comes in. Because as Psalm 91 says, Though a thousand die at your side, and though ten thousand are dying around you, no evil will overcome those who walk in the power and trust and faith of Jesus Christ. So now I want to move forward with 
the seventh seal. This is a great kind of depiction here of the of the seven seals. Now, what you'll see about these seven seals of Revelation, almost every commentary I've read unanimously agree that they're all allegorical once again. I, again, take the literal stance. I believe that Jesus Christ will be in heaven next to God the Father in the great sanctuary, and he's going to open up a literal scroll just like this one right here, and he's going to pull off the seals. And there are seven seals, which are major judgments. Now, the first six seals are individual events that take place, but the seventh seal then has seven unique trumpets associated with it. There are seven angels that blow seven trumpets. They're all part of the same seal, but then there's a subsection of that seal into the seven trumpets. And you get the opinion that those events go fast, that you've got the first through sixth seals are being broken and big things are happening. And then the seventh seal opens up and those seven angels are, are blowing those trumpets in a successive fashion and individual events are happening on the planet. Now, at this moment in time, we're not going to take a look at the first five seals, although they line up with Matthew 24 quite well. Jesus talks about, do not be deceived in Matthew 24. Then he says there's going to be great persecution. They're going to take you into the synagogues and beat you. Then he talks about there's going to be famines on the planet. And then he talks about there's going to be wars and great wars. Then he goes back into the martyrdom. Then he talks about the Son of Man coming back and during the tribulation period where the sun doesn't shine its light. And then he's going to send out the angels to get his elect. So I believe Matthew 24 uh, lines up pretty well with the first multiple books and seals of Revelation. But today we're going to focus on the seventh seal and what these seven trumpets happen when the angels blow them. Now, this is a busy slide. I don't know who put it up on the internet, but I agree with a lot of it. I agree with them in multiple ways. Number one, notice how these seals right here line up with Matthew 24. I totally agree with that. If you read Matthew 24 and you compare it to the opening of these first six seals, you'll see that when Jesus is answering the apostles about what will be the sign of the end of the age and of your return, Jesus is giving them the cliff notes of the book of Revelations. And so that all lines up really well. Also, this person who wrote this diagram here believes that the second coming of Christ is somewhere on the heels of the sixth seal here and this, the opening of the seventh seal. This is where God's people are sealed right here in the sixth seal. And then... We have the seventh seal, and that's somewhere where the rapture of the church takes place. You also notice the time of God's wrath starts right here at the end of the sixth seal. When people say we're not appointed to God's wrath, therefore we're going to be raptured out before any of these seals are broken. What you realize over time is that even though it's Jesus opening the seals because he controls all of prophecy, it's Satan who's doing all these things in these first six seals. It's Satan who comes in on the white horse, which is the counterfeit of Jesus Christ. It's Satan who comes in on the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, etc. And so these are all events coming from Satan. And we are subjected to Satan's wrath, but we're not subjected to God's wrath. That's what we see beginning right here on this timeline from this moment going forward. That's why the rapture of the church has to be somewhere in between the sixth and seventh seal and that all of these trumpet blasts that are part of the seventh seal that we're going to review which are all judgments from god we are not going to be here for those so now i want to get into wormwood and the angel of the bottomless pit i think there's an interesting study there that still um, we need to take a closer look at so revelation 8 this is during the opening of the seventh seal. Remember, it has seven trumpets. 
And then the third angel sounded the third trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of the water, and the name of the star is Wormwood. Every biblical commentary I've read suggests that all of this is allegorical, that, it, that these stars are in reference to nations and things like that. I, I again, take the literal stance. I believe that this is a literal star that's going to fall from heaven, and it's going to collide with the planet. And the name of this star is called Wormwood. And the third of the waters become Wormwood. That word Wormwood means to make bitter or to poison somebody. We're going to take a look at Wormwood in a little while. But from there, then the next angel sounds his trumpet. And a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them was darkened. So it appears that when Wormwood hits the planet, it, it helps cause some of this darkening effect of the sun and the moon and the stars. Now, I had said in previous lectures that there are spiritual entities that are associated with all planetary bodies. And so it's likely that Wormwood, which is a literal comet, if you will, has a spiritual entity attached to it. And I believe that could very well be this angel that we see in Revelation 9. Now, Revelation 9 is when the fifth angel sounds. But remember, that's all still part of the seventh seal. The seventh seal has seven angels that blow their trumpets. So, you know, the third angel is, is Wormwood. And then the fifth angel is, I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And then later in Revelation 9, it says they had a king over them. It's the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Abaddon, or in the Greek, Apollyon. Apollyon means the destroyer of the world. So, somehow we see a planetary body coming down and striking the earth. That's very could very well be what causes... A lot of the catastrophic events that happen on the planet. And that could very well be what Isaiah was referring to when the sky recedes like a scroll and the earth is moved out of its place. It staggers to and fro and um, all of the mountains and islands are moved out of their place. I believe it's likely this planetary body hitting it. Associated with that coming in behind it here, when the next angel blows his trumpet, releases this angel who is the king of the bottomless pit called Apollyon. He comes down to the planet and he opens up the bottomless pit. Now previously I had theorized that it was Wormwood that hit the earth and caused the great earthquake. But now I'm not so sure because there's a little bit of a confliction here Revelation 6 says that Jesus opens the sixth seal, and behold, there was the great earthquake. And then later in Revelation 8, it's during the opening of the seventh seal that the great star falls from heaven burning like a torch called Wormwood. And so, assuming that these seals are opened up in order, one through seven, it seems unlikely that wormwood which is opened wormwood which is released to the planet in the seventh seal could cause the great earthquake that happens in the sixth seal that's not in chronological order therefore based on that i would say that when jesus opens the sixth seal that's that stimulates movement of the tectonic plates and it leads to a humongous earthquake on planet Earth. And when you have a worldwide earth play, earthquake, you're going to see all kinds of you know, catastrophic changes to the planet, including volcanoes, etc. And so it must be that event that, that ejects plume and things into the sky and, and has the effect on the sun and the stars and the moon. And then in the next seal, the seventh seal, 
when Jesus opens the seventh seal and we see the seven trumpets, that's where we see Wormwood strike the planet. Obviously, that's going to have a huge impact on the planet. When a planetary body hits the planet, um, and here specifically, it, it goes on to say that a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that they were darkened. That's difficult to understand, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. Does that mean that where the comet strikes the planet, that aspect of the planet is, is blocked out of the sun and the moon and the stars due to all the plume? And that ends up being approximately a third of the sky that's involved so that you cannot see those planetary bodies. That's a possibility. In other words, if this is planet Earth and an asteroid hits right here, you're going to see an effect right here in the sky that's going to block out the sun and the moon and the stars here. That's a... that. In, in correlation to the rest of the planet and people living over here, that may only be a third of the sky and the sun and the moon that's no longer visible. That's just a theory on my part, of course. Then immediately we see Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So up above in Revelation 8, we see a star fall, and this is a literal comet. And this is worm, named Wormwood. Then down below, we see another star fall. Only this time, this star is analogous to a fallen angel who's been given the key to the bottomless pit. And his name is Apollyon the Destroyer. The next question would be, what is the key to the bottomless pit and how does he open it? So when you look at the bottomless pit, that's Strong's G12, and the Greek word is abyssos. Now that is where we get the word abyss. So the, the word abyss can be used interchangeably with a bottomless pit. It is a deep abyss. It's also known as the pit. The Strong's Concordance says that it is of immeasurable depth. It has no bottom. You can't measure the depth of this pit. It's a very deep gulf or chasm in the lowest parts of the earth that's used as a common receptacle of the dead souls, but especially is the abode of the demons, and that the other name of the pit is called Orcus. Now, Orcus is going to become relevant here in a moment when we take a look at that. So, in Revelation 9, we're told that the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We know that's Abaddon, or Apollyon, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as out of a great furnace. Down here below, you see kind of an analogy of what it must look like, the smoke that's coming out of you know the great earthquakes and we know at this point wormwood has struck the, the planet and so there's all this plume and smoke that's coming out like a furnace perhaps this is what blocks out the sun and makes the moon look like blood and and so forth then we get to verse 3 then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth and that word is literal when you look it up it means literal locust locusts and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And we've looked at the seal of God in the previous lecture. That's a tav. That is the seal of Christ, the, the cross or the tav that the angels place on all of the 144,000 and those who've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Verse 5, these locusts and scorpions were not given authority to kill these men, but just to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and they will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Verse 7, the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. Their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions and there were stings in their tails. And they had the power to hurt men for five months. And they, that is this locust scorpion group that we've just described, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Apollyon the Destroyer. Now that's a very interesting account right there. And in every commentary I've ever studied over the previous years, they've consistently said that this is all analogy of something else. Once again, I'm going to take a brave stance here and say that I think there is a possibility that this could be literal, that we are talking about literal locusts and literal scorpions. Now I realize on the surface that that sounds insane because these scorpion locusts are pretty unusual. They're shaped like horses, they have a gold crown on their head, they have the face of men, they have women's hair, and they have the teeth of lions. They have breastplates of iron, and they have wings. And so that's a pretty unusual looking creature that would be coming out of the bottomless pit. But nonetheless, as time goes on, I've begun to take a literal stance on that, and, and I'll explain why as we proceed forward. But we have to understand that this bottomless pit is the abode of demons. This is where all of the demonic manifestations live. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do these demonic manifestations look like? And now that Apollyon, the fallen angel, has been given the key to the bottomless pit and he opens it, he is allowing the demonic manifestations which live inside of the bottomless pit, they now have access to our four-dimensional time space so that they can come forward into our world. Now, later in Revelation 11, it's talking about the two witnesses, and then it says, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. This is the same beast who sets up the beast system, this is the same beast who sets up the image and the mark of the beast. And so naturally then we would assume that this beast is likely the Antichrist. You say, well, how does the Antichrist come out of the bottomless pit? And I would say that the answer lies in the fact that when Apollyon, the king of the bottomless pit, comes down behind Wormwood and he is given the key to the bottomless pit and he opens it, we see this supernatural spiritual entity, the beast, that ascends out of that bottomless pit and is released into our world and then he goes into perdition. What does that mean? Well, the word, word perdition is apoleia and it means to destroy a vessel the utter destruction of a vessel, like a human vessel, for example. We see this word being used a few times in Scripture. One of them is when dealing with Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is called the son of perdition. And it's referred to him as the son of perdition when Satan enters him, which is what we see in the Gospels during the Last Supper, that it says in the scripture that Satan entered Judas 
and provoked Judas to do the things that he did. And so Satan was able to enter into that vessel and destroy it. And so one possibility here is that when Apollyon, this fallen angel, which the Strong's Concordance puts the example of Satan, that perhaps Apollyon is Satan himself, the, the fallen angel, who is the destroyer of the world. That Satan comes down from the heavens to the earth, he's given the key to the bottomless pit. Inside the bottomless pit is all of the spiritual demonic manifestations that exist, including the beast, and the beast ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, and he goes into perdition, which is to destroy a vessel. At that point, there may be a human being on the planet who's been groomed, both spiritually and genetically, through transhumanism and etc., through DNA manipulation, that Satan has been occupying and working on this human vessel for a period of time so that he will be the proper vessel to receive this spiritual entity that comes out of the bottomless pit. And when the beast is released out of the bottomless pit, it will then go into perdition, meaning it will go into this human DNA modified vessel and enter in the same way that Satan entered into Judas. And that will be the final fulfillment of the Antichrist. That the Antichrist is going to be Satan incarnate in flesh. Meaning that it's not just a matter of Satan finding a way to possess a human body, although he's going to do that, but this isn't just a human body. That the DNA modification, the, 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 the typology of Genesis 6, where the Nephilim, the fallen angels have made it with humans and made Nephilim, in the last days, we're going to see that the fallen angels have been able to genetically hybridize human beings and make another version of Nephilim. And that would be the most appropriate vessel for Satan to occupy spiritually. And that may be what we're looking at here when the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit. Now, what's interesting is, is this word perdition to destroy a vessel is Apollea, and it's a derivative off of Apollyon. They have the same root word, A-P-O-L. And so they're closely related. Apollyon could very well be Satan, and Apollea, going into perdition, represents Satan then entering into a human vessel to fulfill the person of the Antichrist. Now what's also interesting is later in Revelation 20, we see another angel coming down from heaven who also has the key of the bottomless pit. And this time he has a great chain in his hand and he lays hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and he tosses him into the bottomless pit and he binds him there for a thousand years. And he casts him into the bottomless pit, and he shuts him up, and he sets a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So earlier in Revelation 9, we see that this fallen angel Apollyon, the destroyer, is given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opens it up, and he lets all of the entities out. And then later, one of God's angels is given the key to the bottomless pit, and he goes in and he binds up Satan and he tosses him into the bottomless pit. Satan is not currently in the bottomless pit. He is free to roam to and fro, torturing men and being the accuser of the brethren. But one of these days, he is going to be bound at the, after the Battle of Armageddon and he's going to be tossed into that bottomless pit where he's going to sit there for a millennia. So the next question is, where is this bottomless pit? Are we talking about a literal pit in the earth? Or are we talking about a spiritual pit? 
And by that, I mean, if we were to get into the most sophisticated technological digging machines that they make on the planet, and you and I right now started digging a hole in the earth, would we eventually run into a bottomless pit full of all of these demonic entities? I don't believe that we would. I think we'd run into the earth's core and many other things, but I don't believe we would run into this bottomless pit. It's a spiritual pit. That doesn't mean that it's make-believe. It means that it's part of the spiritual realm, which is an upper dimension. Einstein himself proved that mathematically there's at least, I believe it was 12 dimensions that he discovered mathematically, that we live in a four-dimensional time space, and that the spiritual realm is the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth dimensions, the upper dimensions, and that those are superimposed on top of our four-dimensional time space so that we cannot see them, but they exist there. And so inside, uh, underneath the earth, if you will, inside the earth, there are higher dimensions where there is another realm. And it's not just a state of mind, it's a literal place. The bottomless pit is a literal place. If I could, if me and you could go there right now, you'd be able to see, feel, hear, and experience it, just like if we could go to heaven right now, you would be able to see it and feel it and experience it. It is a literal place but it's we're not able to access it at this point and since it's an angel which is a spiritual phenomenon although the scripture makes it clear that they can manifest in our four-dimensional time space but traditionally they're operating in the spiritual realm since an, it's an angel that's opening the bottomless pit and demonic manifestations which are spiritual manifestations are coming out of the bottomless pit then it's reasonable to assert that the pit itself is a spiritual realm in a higher dimension. Now, I believe that CERN, the hydrogen collider, may very well be the key that the angel is given to open the bottomless pit. And I have an interesting study coming up trying to solidify that idea but when you look at a bottomless pit a literal one that is all you're looking at is a big black hole that goes on and on and on forever it has no bottom and when you compare that to a literal black hole in space it's the same thing a black hole has no bottom and so what i would subscribe is that when the angel Apollyon is given the key to the bottomless pit, there is a, an event that happens that shatters the boundaries of space and time using quantum physics to open up a wormhole or a black hole that communicates between two realms, kind of like you see here. Pretend like the bottomless pit is here in this realm and we are here in this realm. Once you open up this black hole here, you now have a umbilical cord, if you will, a uh, access point for all of the demonic manifestations that exist here to enter in here. Only they're not out in space, they're inside the earth, spiritually speaking in a higher realm, kind of like this here. You see this portal being opened up right here between two worlds, one world here and one world here. And all of the nuclear physicists have said that when they crank up the 17 mile long hydrogen collider, which is many miles underneath the surface of the earth, inside the belly of the earth, and they are shooting subatomic particles at each other at the speed of light, that when these particles collide into each other, that it actually tears a hole into the fabric of space and time, creating a black hole, allowing them to access higher alternate parallel realms and dimensions, and that they're able to allow things into our four-dimensional time space from these alternate dimensions. 
that they admit that they're creating a dimensional doorway between our world and another world, and it's taking place underneath the earth. And oddly enough, where CERN was built uh, on the border of Switzerland is the ancient city of Polyacum, which is where they used to worship the god Apollo, who is the god of the netherworld. And obviously there's a connection there with Apollyon, the destroyer. And so whoever put this image on the internet, I think, has, has hit, hit a home run. This is a picture of the hydrogen collider which has been known to open up alternate dimensions. And then they attached a black hole right here with concentric circles because CERN is the key that opens up a black hole or a bottomless pit to allow the spiritual phenomenon to gain access to our four dimensional time space. Now regarding these locus scorpion entities in Revelation 9, there's been a lot of different interpretations about these over the years. Predominantly, people believe that this is a symbolic locust or scorpion that's being talked about and that it represents something else. Now, one of the more common thoughts out there is that John, the revelator, is seeing into the spirit and when he documents Revelation 9, He's really seeing a helicopter and because you know he's back 95 AD he obviously doesn't have any frame of reference to understand what a helicopter looks like and so people have said that this is probably what Revelation 9 is that you know here's you know, they they here's the teeth and here's its face and here is the uh, the crown on top and the breastplate of iron and the tail of the of these um, helicopters as a scorpion and you know that's a reasonable assertion considering that people are grasping for straws to try and figure out what on earth Revelation 9 really means down here you see another scenario where they make it look kind of similar to a scorpion but you know to me it seems unlikely that the angel of the bottomless pit is obviously a spiritual entity. We've already discussed that likely the bottomless pit itself, if this is where the demonic hordes live, then it's a spiritual realm. And so we're talking about a spiritual bottomless pit. We're talking about a spiritual entity that opens it. And to me, it doesn't make sense and is not consistent that now out of this spiritual realm comes these literal technological aircraft that man has made and so I tend to lean towards the literal representation which is more so what we see over here on the right that just perhaps as hard as it is to believe that there are these hybridized creatures living in the bottomless pit and going forward I'm going to try and build a case for why that may be a possibility I'm not saying that that's what it is. I'm saying that that may be a possibility that when John talks about these locusts who have the tails of a scorpion that can sting men um, and that they have a, a crown on their head and the face of a man with hair of a woman and a breastplate, etc., that he may be describing some type of hybridized demonic entity that's being released out of the bottomless pit. Now that sounds pretty fanciful, but let me try and build an argument for why that's a possibility. First of all, we see other examples in the scripture of where demons are referred to as scorpions and serpents. Luke 10 says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the Demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's Satan. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. It's clear in this account that Jesus is calling these serpents and scorpions 
he refers to them as spirits. And in the previous verse 17, they referred to them as demons. And so now Jesus says, I give you the authority to trample on these serpents and scorpions. Is he talking about a literal serpent and scorpion? Did he send out the apostles in the 70 to go into the cities and find literal snakes that are slithering on the ground and literal scorpions and to run along and stomp on them? No. This was a euphemistic expression of the demonic manifestations. The demons and the spirits, here Jesus is using these terms to, to represent the spirits. He's calling them serpents and scorpions. So, if Jesus can do that here in Luke 10, then perhaps John is referring to these locusts and scorpions as well as these demonic manifestations that are coming out of the pit. We also see this in Psalm 91 in the Old Testament. Because you've made the Lord your refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall overcome you, nor, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he charges his angels over you to keep you in all your ways. That means that we have guardian angels who minister to the body of Christ. And in their hands, they'll lift you up and keep you from dashing your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the dragon you'll trample underfoot. In the King James, it's a lion and the adder. And in the newer versions, they replace adder with a cobra. And in the King James, it's the young lion and the dragon, which they later replaced with serpent. So now, was it was Psalm 91 talking about these men, these believers at that at that time? actually going out and stomping on a literal lion that they like they have in Africa, stomping on a lion's head and, and, and trampling on a on a cobra's head and on a literal dragon? No. We're talking about angels in the verse before, which are a supernatural spiritual phenomenon, who are going to lift you up and keep you from striking your foot against a stone, and that spiritually you'll be able to trample on lions and adders and dragons and serpents, which are all euphemistic expressions for the demonic realm that exists under the serpent, the dragon, Satan. So again, these this is the kind of terminology that's being used to talk about demonic entities. Therefore, applying that line of logic... Is it possible that when this angel of the bottomless pit, which is a spiritual entity, is able to open up this supernatural spiritual realm, which is this bottomless pit or black hole that's in a higher spiritual realm than what our four-dimensional time space is, but once he's able to open that up, now these entities are able to cross over through that doorway, if you will, that portal. A portal has been opened to allow these entities to come into our world. And just perhaps these locusts and scorpions are not some euphemistic expression for something like a helicopter, but they're literal, demonic, hybridized manifestations. Now I'm going to try and continue to build on this case going forward. So I want to take a look at this bottomless pit. We know that the Greek word is abyssos. That's where we get the word abyss. It means the immeasurable depth of Orcus. Orcus is synonymous with the bottomless pit or the abyss. Orcus was the Latin word for the god of the underworld, also known as Hades. Now we see that word in the Old Testament quite frequently. People often get that confused with hell. It's the nether world or the grave in the ground. And it's said to be the realm of the dead. And when you look up Hades in the Strong's Concordance, it's also known as Orcus. So Orcus, Hades, the Abyss, and the Bottomless Pit all are basically synonyms for each other. And Orcus is considered the infernal region, the dark and dismal place that exists in the very depths of the earth where disembodied spirits go to live. Now, in the book of Enoch, we're told where the demons come from. They are disembodied spirits of the Nephilim hybrids that died during that era and during the flood. 
So this word Orcus means the land of the dead, and it has come it has come to be known today as demons that exist in the underworld, monsters. In Italian, they call them Orco, and this refers to kinds of monsters that we see in fairy tales about creatures that feed on human flesh. This was the inspiration for J.R.R. Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings when he came up with the word orcs. If you've seen that movie, we did a lecture earlier in the days of Noah series about the occult nature of The Lord of the Rings and how that's really a euphemistic expression for the planet Saturn and that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was involved in the occult and his movie was shrouded in occult Saturnian, Saturnian um, symbolism that's similar to Aleister Crowley's Brotherhood of Saturn. And Tolkien stated in a letter to Gene Wolfe, Orcs I derive from the Anglo-Saxon word meaning demon, which is supposed to be derived from the Latin orcus meaning hell. So, what's the point? Well, our own Bible talks about Hades and the bottomless pit. And a synonym of that, uh, something that can be interchangeably used with that, is Orcus. And this is where the Orcs come from. Take a look at these guys. These are the creatures, some of them, that live in the bottomless pit. These hybridized humanoid creatures who drink blood and eat flesh. Also, if you look at some of the fantasy games, such as Dungeons and Dragons, which has always been a highly satanic game. They also have a character by the name of Orcus, who is in the role-playing game, and he's known as the Prince of the Undead. And he comes from the bottomless pit. And when you look at the Dungeons & Dragons examples, you see all these different entities. Here is a creature, looks like an angel. He has horns, kind of like Satan. He has a tail and angel wings. Here's another interesting picture of orcs down in the netherworld. These great big huge giants that are humanoid looking. Same thing over here. This here is another image of Orcus who comes out of the abyss in the game. Now you may say, well, that's just a game. But what I would say to you is, is it's more, there's more to it than that. That there's a supernatural spirit that's working through those who came up with the game and that the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game was inspired by spirit guides, and so were these creatures. In other words, even though this all seems imaginary, it's based on a kernel of truth. Now what's interesting is the word Orcus is synonymous with Demogorgon. This name is derived from a combination of Greek words demon, like we see in the Bible, and Gorgos, which is the ancient Greek monsters that were first brought up in Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad. Now that's interesting because we've looked at Hesiod's Theogony and Homer's Iliad in the past. These are the stories about the Greek gods and the demigods, which are half human, half gods, and the battle of the Titans. And I'd said in the past that that entire Greek mythology is all just a retelling of the pre-flood Genesis 6 phenomenon that took place before the flood. So these demogorgons were taken up by Christian writers as these major demons that exist in hell, including John Milton, who wrote the famous epic poem Paradise Lost in the 1600s. One of the verses he says is, Orcus and Aids and the dreaded name of the Demogorgon. Orcus is in reference to the bottomless pit, and Aids is a word that means Hades, because they're the same thing. Orcus and Hades is the bottomless pit. And notice how he attributes those two words to the dreaded name of the Demogorgon. So a Demogorgon is an entity that comes from Orcus or Hades or the bottomless pit. And when you look at this book written by John Milton, it's, it's a pretty fascinating book that has a lot of interesting truths in it. It's an epic poem they wrote in the 1600s, which concerns the biblical story of the fall of Adam in the garden 
and it also describes the fall of Lucifer from heaven and the Luciferian rebellion and the angelic wars that happen in heaven when, when Lucifer rebelled. And so Milton's story has two narratives. One's about Satan or Lucifer and the other's about Adam and Eve. It begins after Satan and the other rebel angels have been defeated by the good angels and they're banished to a place called hell, which in the poem is referred to as Tartarus. Tartarus is the lowest depths of this place called Hades, this, in, this immeasurable chasm or gulf or pit. And so essentially, um, we're talking about the same place, this bottomless pit. Now what's interesting is Milton uses the word Tartarus to describe the place where the fallen angels, the rebel angels who mated with the women are cast. Now why is that important? Because it turns out that when you look at the Greek mythology, the good gods cast the evil gods into a place called Tartarus. During the Battle of the Titans, this is where the evil wicked Titans were cast into, the lowest levels of hell called Tartarus. That's also the exact same word that Peter uses in the New Testament when he's talking about the angels before the flood during Noah's day who left their first estate and went after strange flesh, they were judged and cast into Tartarus. So the point being is that it's very evident that it's all the same story. The Greek version of the gods and the demigods is nothing more than a retelling of the angels, the fallen angels, and the Nephilim who are all cast into a place called Tartarus. Now in this story, in Milton's Paradise Lost, he talks about a city called Pandemonium after the Greek god Pan, which is a hybrid human goat. We've looked at Pan in the past. In, in, his, in his mythological fictional story here, Pandemonium is the capital city of hell where Satan employs his skills to organize all of his followers. He has many demons and principalities called Mammon, Beelzebub, Belial, and Moloch who are all present. And at the end of the debate, Satan volunteers to corrupt the newly created earth and God's new and most favored creation, mankind. He braves the dangers of the bottomless pit and after an arduous traversal of the chaos outside of hell, he enters God's new material world where he enters the Garden of Eden and successfully seduces mankind and leads to the fall of humanity. So there's a lot of interesting truths in the book. Uh, it's a very long book. These are just some of the different renditions that have been done. It shows Satan or Lucifer being cast out of heaven after he rebelled. Here's the good angels, Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and the others who are casting Lucifer out. And he's a literal fallen angelic being. He's referred to as the dragon and the serpent, although I don't personally believe we're dealing with a literal snake, but we're dealing with an entity. Um, when you look at the Strong's Concordance and you study Genesis 3, uh, the Hebrew version of the serpent is the Nakash, and the verb form of the Nakash is a great diviner, a mesmerizer, and a seducer, one who whispers in the ear like he's making a hissing sound. He whispers in Eve's ear as he seduces her to go against God. This is the, this is the angelic being who seduced Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, why is all this important? Because John Milton recognized that this place called Tartarus, this lowest level of hell, he also referred to that as Hades or Orcus. And he said that the major demon that lives at the bottom of the pit is called a Demogorgon. So we need to take a look at what a Demogorgon is. So we see examples of Demogorgons throughout history. One of them is in the infamous game Dungeons and Dragons, which is a very powerful fantasy role-playing game based on witchcraft and sorcery. And it is definitely a demonically charged game. 
Most people who indulge in that game are deeply into the occult and Satanism. In the game, Demogorgon is a powerful demonic prince that comes from the bottomless pit. He's known as the Prince of Demons. And uh, he's acknowledged by mortals and even his fellow demons as being one of the most powerful and influential. Now in the game Dungeons and Dragons, he's depicted as an 18 foot tall and a lot of times that number is the representation of 666. If you if you add up 666, you get 18. Notice he's a reptilian entity. He's hermaphroditic in nature and is referred to as a tenari. That's a sort of species of demogorgon that's somewhat humanoid. So, we know that Satan or Lucifer is called the dragon, the serpent, and that he has some reptilian features. And so... It makes sense that a demogorgon that exists in the bottomless pit would be reptilian in nature. It's hermaphroditic in nature, kind of like Baphomet, who's also hermaphroditic. It's a male goat with female breasts. And then, of course, the Nephilim creatures were all humanoid because they come from the genetic mixing of humans and fallen angels. So they take on a humanoid fashion. Now, this particular demogorgon it has two individual heads that have twin snake-like necks and their arms end in tentacles. And they are referred to as a Tenari. So this here is a Demogorgon from the game Dungeons and Dragons. He comes from the bottomless pit. And he's a type of Tenari. Now if you look at Tenari, there's a whole bunch of different examples. These are all Tenari that come from the bottomless pit. They're considered to be elemental demons. Their homeland is the Abyss. That's the bottomless pit, and they speak abyssal, celestial, and draconic languages. And they are the dominant subcategory of demons that are the dominant race of demons that exist in the abyss. They're most known as demon lords and are referred to as Tanari. Remember, this demonic hierarchy underneath Satan is just like the military. They've got generals and colonels and majors, etc. That's why Paul talks about them in Ephesians 6. He lists them off as principalities, powers, archons, etc. And so they have a they have a high hierarchy scheme. And so the Tenari are these classic demons. And what's interesting is that in the game Dungeons and Dragons. These demons arose as a result of humanity, and they were reflections of cruelty, evil, and sin. Now, that's very interesting because that aligns with the book of e Enoch quite well. We know the fallen angels made it with humans and created all these hybrids, and that all these hybrids indulged in all of this sin that we saw before the flood. Bestiality, sexual immorality, rape, blood drinking, cannibalism, etc., and so, so it is interesting that these demogorgons arise from humanity and that they basically have humanoid shape. Now look at these guys. What do you notice about all of them? All of these demogorgons that are in the bottomless pit? Well, first of all, they're all sort of humanoid-like. I mean, this guy has a human-like body. Big, muscular giants, just like the Nephilim. Big, muscular giants. Big, muscular giants. Big, muscular giants. Big muscular joints with human-like hands and a torso. But then you see the demonic heads and the wings on them. Same thing here. Demonic face with wings. Demonic face with wings. Demonic head and horns. Demonic face with wings. So you begin to see this humanoid, demonic entity with angelic wings. Now, in your mind, if you could take the DNA of an angel and splice it together with the DNA of a human and create some kind of entity that has a demonic, abominable spirit inside of it, this is what you would get. And so what I'm trying to insinuate is, is that these spirit, these disembodied spirits of the Nephilim are these Demogorgon prince entities that live in the bottom of the bottomless pit. Some of them are roaming around the earth, and some of them have been cast into the pit. Now, to prove that these Demogorgons were genetic hybridized species that when they died, they gave up their disembodied spirits, which were also genetic 
hybridized spiritual entities, it turns out that Medusa in Greek mythology is a type of Demogorgon from the bottomless pit. She is called a Gorgon. That's a mythical creature portrayed in Greek literature personified by the goddess Medusa. It refers to the three sisters who are made of living venomous snakes and they're able to turn people into stone. What do you notice about Medusa? She's humanoid, but she has a reptilian body and snakes on her head. She's the blending of human and a snake. In other words, prior to the flood, the fallen angels had the ability to splice the DNA of humans and snakes together, and they made these abominations. Now, you may say, that's ridiculous. I have a hard time believing that. But you don't. if that's the case, you just need to take a look at DNA. You can take the DNA of two species and blend them together and create the same thing. That's why we're seeing that in, in, in uh, Hollywood today. Take the movie Splice. They took the DNA of a creature and they mixed it with a human. And they have this little creature right here that's a humanoid creature, no different than Medusa. Same thing with species. An alien ended up sleeping with a human being and it made a half-human, half-alien creature. This is all just um, subliminal programming for these Nephilim entities that have existed since the beginning of time. And the fact that a Demogorgon is nothing more than an entity like Medusa, who, by the way, was destroyed by Perseus. Who was Perseus? Perseus was a demigod. He had a human mother, and one of the gods from Mount Olympus was his father. That's no different than an angel mating with women to make a, a Nephilim. It's the same concept. Now, for those of you who have didn't watch some of the early lectures of the Days of Noah series, the first six lectures nail down the following points that I'm going to quickly review. The King James Bible says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth that daughters were born to them, and the sons of God, that's the B'nai Ah Elohim, that's the fallen angels, they saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took the wives against their will for themselves, all of whom they chose. And the very next verse, then there were giants on the earth in those days, the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. These are the mythological demigods, like Hercules, who were men of renown. The book of Jasher goes on to say, And the rulers, that's in reference to the angels, the rulers went to the daughters of men, and they took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice. And the sons of men in those days took from the cattle of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the air, and they taught the mixture of animals of one species with another in order to provoke the Lord. And God saw that the whole earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon earth. All men and all animals. It's not just the animals that were being genetically hybridized together, as it says here. See what the book of Jasher says, that they taught the mixture of animals that means they spliced together the DNA of different animals, making chimeras. But not just the animals, all men and all animals were corrupt. That word corrupt means to be marred from its original image, to be genetically corrupted. The Book of Jubilees says the same thing. And it came to pass when the children of men began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born of them that the angels of God saw on a certain year of Jubilee that the women were beautiful to look upon and they took themselves wives of all whom they chose and they bear unto them sons who were the giants and lawlessness increased on the earth and all flesh corrupted its way alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walk on the earth all of them corrupted their ways and their orders, and they began to devour each other. To say that they corrupted their ways and their orders, orders means their species, their phylum, their orders. 
and lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts was only evil continually. Notice again that all men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walketh on the earth. That means that human beings were genetically being hybridized with cattle. That's where we get minotaurs, half human, half bull. That's where we get the concept of Moloch, the Old Testament God, which is always represented as a human body with a bull's head. This is where the bull worship originates. Even thousands of years later in the days of Christ, do we see Josephus, the famous historian, the uh, Jewish historian who documents in the antiquities of the Jews, he writes that many angels of God accompanied women. What does that mean? They were with the women and they begat sons that proved to be unjust, despisers of all that were good on account of the confidence that they had in their own strength. See, they were large men. For the tradition goes, now this is Josephus 2,000 years ago talking about the oral traditions going all the way back to the flood. It was common knowledge in that day that this had happened. The tradition goes that these men did what resembled the act of those whom the Grecians call giants. Who are the Grecians? They're the Greeks who have all the mythological stories of these gods who come down from the heavens, sleep with the women, and make these demigods. But Noah was very uneasy at what they did. He was displeased with their conduct. He tried to persuade them to change their dispositions and act in a righteous way. But seeing that they did not yield to him, but they were slaves of their wicked pleasures, he was afraid they would kill him and his family and children and those that had married. So he departed out of the land and then he went on to build the ark. Even later in book five, Josephus says, they removed their camp to Hebron and when they had taken it, they slew all the inhabitants. They were, they were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the he hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. See, Josephus documents that even back in David's day, when they were trying to destroy the wicked, evil Canaanites in Joshua's day, there was a race of giants that were still left who had large bodies with very strange countenances that were entirely different from regular men. They were shocking to look at and even to hear. That means that they were humanoid, but they were not fully human. They were human angel hybrids. Now it makes it clear in the book of Enoch that these hybrids were killed and they released their disembodied spirits on the planet. Enoch chapter seven, verse one. And all of the others together, that is the angels, with them took upon themselves wives. And each chose for himself one, and they began to go in unto them and defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments. That's the origin of witchcraft and sorcery, the cutting of roots for mind-altering drugs. They made them acquainted with plants. They became pregnant, and they bore giants, whose height was 3,000 L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and they devoured mankind. That means they became cannibals and blood drinkers. And they began to sin against the birds. What does that mean? Bestiality. They began to sin against the birds, the beasts, and even the reptiles and the fish. And they began to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. Enoch 10 says, the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by the fallen angel Azazel. To him ascribe the bastards and the reprobates all sin. This is the true origin of the word bastards. The Nephilim are the true bastards. They, uh, the word bastard means to be hybridized with something else that's not, that you're not originally part of. Enoch 15 says, and I heard a voice. Fear not, Enoch, thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach here and hear my voice. Go to the watchers who've left the high, holy, and eternal heaven and have lain with women and defiled themselves with the daughter of men and begotten giants as, as their sons. I have given men wives so that they might impregnate them and beget children. 
But you angels were spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you. For as the spiritual ones of the heaven, in heaven is their dwelling. And now these giants who are produced from the spirits and the flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and upon the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they're born from men and from the holy watcher angels. They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. And the spirits of the giants, that is the Nephilim, shall afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless they hunger and thirst and cause offense. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and women because they have proceeded from these men and women. That's what we're dealing with on the planet when we're dealing with all of the demonic manifestation. And that's what we're dealing with in the bottomless pit. We see the word Demogorgon first portrayed in Christopher Marlowe's famous book, Dr. Faustus in the 1500s. This is a classic German legend in which Dr. Faust gets bored and depressed with his life. After an attempt to commit suicide, he calls upon the devil for further knowledge and magic power with which to indulge all of the pleasure and knowledge of the world. In response, the devil sends his representative, Mephistopheles. He makes, then Dr. Faust goes on to make the bargain with Mephistopheles, in which he will serve Faust with his magic powers for a set of number of years, and at the end of the term, the devil will reclaim Faust's soul and he will be eternally enslaved into hell. Most of us have heard of this story. This is this uh, legend that's been the basis for many liter literary, artistic, cinematic, and musical works for the last 500 years. It's where we get the word, the Faustian deal. Whenever you hear someone say that they made a Faustian bargain or a Faustian deal, that implies a situation where an ambitious person surrenders their moral integrity in order to achieve power and success. In other words, they sell their soul to the devil for power. And when you look at the original book, 1950, the devil's representative here, Mephistopheles, this is an image of him. And what do you see? This fallen angelic entity who's a humanoid creature with angelic wings. And he's referred to in the book, Dr. Faustus as a Demogorgon. We know that Demogorgons are the type of princes that come from Orcus or Hades, that is the bottomless pit. And this word Mephistopheles is actually a Hebrew word, Mephi, which means the disperser, and Tophel, which means the plaster of lies. So he is the disperser of lies. The name can also have a combination of three Greek words, mean, me as a negative negation, phos means light and phylos means loving, making it not light loving, which is a paradox for Lucifer the light bearer. In the story, Faust makes a deal with the devil for the price of his soul. The devil sends a demogorgon, Mephistopheles, who comes from the abyss. Mephistopheles helps Faust seduce a beautiful and innocent girl. Usually her name is Gretchen. This is similar to the story of Eve. Mephistopheles teaches Faust how to seduce this innocent girl named Gretchen whose life is ultimately destroyed when she gives birth to Faust's bastard son. Isn't that interesting? In the book, Faust's son is a bastard that he that born out of wedlock. Now we know what the real meaning of that word is. A bastard, that word was invented. The etymology of that word derives in the notion of the Nephilim, half human, half hybrids. And so really what's happened in this book is Mephistopheles has figured out how to seduce the innocent girl Gretchen and lie with her and sleep with her and impregnate her, making a half human, half demogorgon. 
Ultimately, Gretchen, when she sees how unholy the child is, she drowns it and kills it and murders it. However, Gretchen's innocence saves her in the end, and she still enters heaven after the execution because this child was not considered a natural child, but rather it was a hybrid child. And just as we see in the scripture, God charges the nation of Israel multiple times with wiping out the evil, wicked Nephilim tribes. And so in the book, Gretchen is not charged with murder by drowning and killing this hybrid child, this bastard Nephilim child. However, in Goeth's rendition, Faust himself is irrevocably corrupted and believes his sins cannot be forgiven. And when the, when the Faustian deal is over, he made a deal with the devil, the devil carries him off to hell into the deep bottomless pit where the Demogorgons come from. It's quite a story. And as you can see, the story is not just an imaginary story, but some of the concepts are based on real events. Now we see Demogorgons pop up again a few years later in Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, another epic poem which Spencer writes about the prequel of King Arthur and Sir Lancelot. This is back in young Arthur's teenage years, if you will. The poem features an adventure with an altogether new cast of knights and ladies and champions who must quest for true love and virtue, combating wicked monsters, wizards, and witches in a land drenched with symbolism and enchantment. It's full of witchcraft and sorcery. A bold, a bold bad man who is called the Great Gorgon or the Prince of Darkness comes out after hours in the, in, after uh, the sun goes down at, at which a cockatiss quakes and the sticks is put to flight. That's one of the stanzas in this famous book, The Fairy Queen. A bold bad man that dared to be called by the name Great Gorgon the prince of darkness and deadly night, at which Cocteus quakes and the sticks is put to flight. And then the next verse, down in the bottom of the deep abyss, where Demogorgon in full darkness pent, far from the view of gods in heaven bliss, the hideous chaos keeps their dreadful dwelling is. So here you have Edmund Spencer talking about the bottomless pit where the Demogorgons which is the great prince of darkness, exists. So what's the point? The point is, is that the Bible makes it clear that the bottomless pit is the abyss. And in the Strong's Concordance, the abyss is the same place where Hades or Orcus is. It's the land of the netherworld, the deep chasm where disembodied souls in the demonic manifestations live. Orcus also becomes synonymous with orcs, with demogorgons, with Tanari, with Mephistopheles, with Medusa, etc. So when you begin to look at all of these entities we've just reviewed, you start to notice something about them. They're humanoid-like. A lot of them have wings. They look like human beings, but they have angelic features. They're all hybrids. Even when you look at the goat god Pan, he's half human, half goat. When you look at the official symbol of the Church of Satan, you have a human goat with angel wings. Medusa was a hybrid. You've got the orcs from J.A.R.R. Tolkien's books, which are humanoid creatures who eat flesh. And you begin to see these same commonalities. And so I believe that there's enough evidence throughout history to suggest that the bottomless pit is a literal place. It's not a state of mind or a dream state. There is a real place called Hades, Orcus, the abyss, or the bottomless pit. It exists. And right before the return of Jesus Christ, the angel of the bottomless pit, Satan, Apollyon, he finds a way to open that pit and allow these entities to return into our world to terrorize humanity in the last days. 
And I do not believe that all of these stories going back centuries to today are just a lot of different individuals who had an overactive imagination. But I believe it's the supernatural, spiritual entity at work, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, who's been working on the planet for centuries to continue to keep this concept of the Nephilim alive in the psyche of humanity which is going to build upon the last day's events. Now I want to take a look at one of my favorite books of all time that will really kind of help corroborate this theory. I absolutely would recommend that every person listening to these videos purchase this book on Amazon or wherever called Placebo by Howard Pittman. It's a very small, short little book. You can easily get through it in an hour or two. Um, and it's well worth reading and you're going to want to read it multiple times. There's also a video on YouTube. I strongly recommend you go and watch the video. It kind of gives you the cliff note versions of the book. But basically, in 1979, a Southern Baptist preacher by the name of Howard Pittman, I believe, got into a car accident or some kind of event happened and he ruptured his abdominal artery and he died. And while they were resuscitating and working on him, he had an out-of-body experience where his spirit was lifted from his body and taken into the second heaven, which is the spiritual realm, where he saw many startling things. He also appeared before the Lord in the third heaven, where he pleaded for an extension of his physical life. It was there that God showed him what kind of life of worship and service to Jesus Christ he had really led. He was given a message to bring back to God's latter rain soldiers for this last day's generation. These are some of the cliff notes that I took off the YouTube videos regarding this book, Placebo. This is Howard Pittman's story and testimony. As we move through the dimensional wall into the second heaven, I found myself in an entirely different world, far different from anything I'd ever imagined. This world was a place occupied by spirit beings as vast in number as the sands of the seashore. These beings were demons and devils and fallen angels and were in thousands of different shapes and forms. Even those in similar shapes and forms were contrasted by different coloring. Many of the demons were in human shapes or forms and many were in forms similar to animals familiar to our present world. Others were in shapes and forms so hideous to imagine. Some of the forms were so morbid and revolting that I was almost to the point of nausea. He goes on to say, Make no mistake about demons, for they are very real. The Bible makes more statement about demons than it does about angels, and it points it out in Luke 10 that demons are evil. In Mark 5, he indicates how numerous they are. In Matthew 10, he shows how they are unclean. And in Matthew 12, he states that they are under the command of Satan, and he shows that they can possess humans. In the demon world, there is a division of power, much like a military structured chain command with rank and order. Certain demons carry the title of prince, which is always the demon in charge of a principality. Now, we just took a look at some of the principalities in some of history, including Dungeons and Dragons. That's what they look like, what we reviewed earlier. A principality is a territorial spirit. A territory, an area, a place, or a group that may range in size from as large as a nation to as small as a person. When Satan assigns a prince a task, the prince is given the authority to act in the name of Satan and use whatever means necessary or available to him to accomplish the task. As each type of demon was pointed out to me, I quickly discovered a social order or rank that existed among them. Those at the top of the order were revealed in forms similar to humans. As we moved down the order or rank, I saw demons in shapes or forms that looked a lot like half animal, half human. Isn't that interesting? I saw demons in forms resembling animals that we know in the present world, and I saw demons in forms and shapes that were so revoltingly morbid that you cannot possibly imagine them. At the very top of the order were the warring demons, which were the cream of Satan's crop. 
They moved about the second heaven, were always traveling in groups, never alone. Wherever they went, all other demons moved out of their way. These warring demons were revealed to me in human form. They looked like humans, with the exception that they were giants, appearing to be about eight feet tall. They were rugged and handsomely constructed, somewhat like giant athletes. This makes me think about some of the Grecian stories of the demigods like Hercules and Perseus. At one time during this tour of the second heaven, I watched the demons within their own related group, and I experienced an awful feeling. It was an overwhelming, oppressive, morbid feeling. The feeling came to me shortly after I'd entered the second heaven, and I wondered what was causing it. It was as, at this time that I learned that the angel could read my mind because my guardian angel said to me, that feeling you're wondering about is caused by the fact that there's no love in this world. The angel was telling me that in this second heaven, there is not one bit of love. Wow. Can you imagine all of those demons serving a master they don't love and the master ruling over beings that he doesn't love? Worse than that, these companions are working together for an eternity and they do not even love each other. When we got down to the fourth group or order, all the demons of this rank were revealed in forms other than humans. Some had forms like known animals, while others had unknown forms. In this group were the demons of murder, brutality, sadism, and others related to carnage. I was totally flabbergasted as I watched and horrified as I saw the demons in all shapes and forms as they moved at will among the humans. While I learned about demons not being able to work in a person's life against their will, I also learned the angels cannot do it either. Each born-again Christian has a guardian angel, and before that Christian's life is over, it might take a whole host of angels to keep him. First of all, he talks about all of these weird formed demons. So when we go back to Revelation 9 and we're talking about the locusts and the scorpions who have human faces and long hair and breastplates on their chest and they have big scorpion tails, is it a possibility that we're talking about these demonic entities in the bottomless pit? I would say that that is a possibility. Secondly, he's alluding to the fact that Christians have guardian angels. Now, I've heard a lot of brothers and sisters say that that's not biblical. But when you really look closely throughout the scripture, we see that angels minister to people that are Christians. And it makes it clear in multiple areas. I've already reviewed some of those verses earlier, such as Psalm 91. The fighting that these demons do is sort of like, oh no, excuse me, the angels. The fighting that the angels do is sort of like protecting our blind side. They oppose the demons when the demons come against us outside the area of our will. They oppose the demons when the demons come against us through our own will. Remember, we're made in the image of God, and like God, we have a sovereign will. I learned that the demons will fight the angels if they have to, but they prefer not to do so. They, they found that it's easier and safer to destroy us through our own will where the angels are unable to interfere rather than to go outside our will where they have to fight the angels personally. Now that's very interesting. In other words, these demons just can't attack you because they'd have to go through these angels and sometimes they try to do that. But where these demons are able to attack you is when you give them the rights to attack you through sin in your life. If you're operating in gross sin, then your guardian angel does not have the legal rights to stop these demons from assaulting you. However, Satan and his army of demons are not in hell presently. Neither do they want to be there. That's right. They don't want to go to the bottomless pit. I was not permitted to look into hell, nor was I permitted to view the chained demons. I do know that these chained demons went beyond the limitations of their domain. God in his wisdom has allowed Satan and his demons certain bounds or limitations within which they work. But I was made aware of the fact that not all demons are in the second heaven, but there are some demons that are so awesome that they are reserved in chains in hell. The demons that are reserved in chains did not obtain permission for their activity, which violated the restrictions established by the Lord. Their illegal deeds are recorded in Genesis 6 
because they did not obtain permission, they received immediate punishment. Specific punishment for the devil and his demons is scheduled for the end time and is recorded in Revelation 20, which is the verse, by the way, that says that one day they will be cast into the bottomless pit and chained up and cast in there and have a seal put over it. As you well know, the lake of fire was created for the devil and the demons and their fallen angels. So once again, Howard Pittman in his out-of-body experience when he enters the second heaven confirms that there are all kinds of evil-shaped demonic manifestations all over the planet trying to torture us, just like the book of Enoch says. And then there are some specific angels and fallen demonic Nephilim who are chained up in hell, which at this time is the bottomless pit. And this is the one that Apollyon is going to open up after Wormwood smashes into planet Earth. Mr. Pittman goes on to talk about how the spirit took him into, I believe, like a cafeteria where there was a ma married man and married woman sitting there together planning out their adulterous situation where they were going to go be together. And he actually witnessed a demon that he described look like a green reptilian frog that was piggybacked around the two of them. And this is what he said. When the demon of lust from the fifth order of demons. See, in the book, he goes through the different ranks and files of demons. That's why I strongly recommend that you get that book because you can learn a lot about demonology in the book. When the demon of lust from the fifth order reached the man's face, suddenly, like a puff of smoke, he disappeared into the man's face and possession was completed. He goes on to say that this demon was so horrible in appearance of shape and form that I recognized him immediately to be from the lower group of demons, which is the perverted group. The angels and the demons and I were in the spirit in that room and aware of everything that was happening. Those in the flesh were only aware of themselves, for they could not see or hear us, even though we were back in this physical world. Notice what this looks like right here. Almost like a toad or a frog that enters this man who's getting ready to commit adultery. To conclude, Pittman says at times even the strongest Christians doubt the existence and activities of these demons, which makes it even easier for the demons. However, man was not left defenseless. Being made in the image of God, man, like God, has a sovereign will, and no demon or spirit can violate that will without the permission of the individual person himself. And because of this, these demons have developed great skills in deception so that we will fall into sin, so that we give Satan and the demonic hierarchy legal access to come into the kingdom, our, our vessel. Now, is there anything in Scripture that would sort of confirm this understanding? Let's just take a look in Revelation 16. I saw three unclean spirits, That's that word is demon, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of Armageddon of God Almighty. So we see right here that the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan all have these demons that come out of their mouths. And, you know, when you take a look at them, he says that they look like frogs. That's very, very consistent with what Howard Pittman said. He witnessed this demonic entity that was going into this man. It looked like a, a green frog. We see in Revelation 18, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and is the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And so, first of all, for those who don't believe that there's demons in the last days, this is near the end of Revelations after Mystery Babylon has been destroyed on planet Earth, and Mystery Babylon becomes a habitation full of demons and devils and every foul spirit. Notice how it's a foul spirit. It's an unclean, foul, disgusting spirit and a cage for every unclean, that's another word that's similar to foul and hateful bird. 
Look how it uses the analogy of a bird, that it may have wings and kind of these de demonic entities can look like different animals. And so it becomes evident that there is a great level of demonic manifestation that's going to be introduced onto the planet during the last days when Satan knows his time is short and he tries to make a play for the whole planet. And at that time, the bottomless pit's going to be opened up and there are going to be these locust scorpion entities that are coming out of the pit. Now, can I be certain that those are literal entities? No, obviously I cannot be certain. However, when you put that in context of all of the different things that we've looked at, that the bottomless pit or the abyss is the same thing as Hades and Orcus. And from Orcus is where we get the notion of these flesh-eating orcs and these demogorgons and the Tanari and all of those different hybridized, humanoid, fallen angelic creatures that we've looked at. It becomes apparent that the Nephilim entities are going to resurface in the last days. Now we're coming into the end of the lecture and I just want to finish the lecture with regards to a man named H.P. Lovecraft. He was a deep occultist and a fictional writer who wrote the book Necronomicon in 1927. The book is also referred to as the Book of the Dead and it's a grimoire. That is a textbook of magic and it involves Enochian magic that can be traced all the way back to famous 1500s occultist John Dee. Now John Dee was the personal assistant for Queen Elizabeth back in the Dark Ages just leading up to the Renaissance and he was a deep occultist. We've already looked at John Dee in the past. He was obsessed with Enochian magic. He studied the grimoires of King Solomon. He used the six-pointed star to help do all kinds of rituals and witchcraft and so it's interesting that H.P. Lovecraft channeled this book, The Necronomicon, and it's become a very legendary book for the power to summon demons from hell that is the bottomless pit. And in the work, Necronomicon, it contains an account of creatures that he refers to as the old ones. And he talks about their history and the means for summoning them. Now what's really interesting is that Kenneth Grant, the one who was the successor of Aleister Crowley and was the head of the Typhonian Ordo Templi Order Orientis. He, he was a deep occultist also in the 1940s and 50s. He suggested in his book, The Magic Revival in 1972, that there must have been some unconscious astral connection between this H.P. Lovecraft and Aleister Crowley because all of their writings and spells had so much overlap. From what history reveals, these men were living on the planet at the same time, but perhaps they never did meet each other. But Kenneth Grant says that they were very like-minded guys and that somehow they were connected in the spirit realm. Now, both of these guys were known for astral projecting and having out-of-body experiences, so it's quite possible that they did hook up in the ethereal plane and exchange notes for all we know. Or the other explanation of why they're so similar is the same supernatural spirit that's working through Crowley is the same supernatural spirit working through Lovecraft. Either way, Kenneth Grant claimed that they both drew on the same occult forces, which I believe to be true. However, Crowley was mostly through magic and Lovecraft was mostly through dreams, which ins inspired all of his stories of the Necronomicon. That's really interesting. Kenneth Grant was the one who later would be the one who started something called Lamb Meditation. If you recall, Aleister Crowley did a ritual called the Amalantra Working Ritual in 1918. He used a six-pointed star with a high-level medium by the name of Roddy Minor. In 1918 in New York City, they opened up a portal um, through the boundaries of space and time and allowed an extraterrestrial entity by the name of Lamb, L-A-M, which comes after the Dalai Lama, the path of enlightenment. This little guy right here materialized literally into their living room through this portal. And later Kenneth Grant said that Lamb was a quote, a great old one whose archetype is recognizable in accounts of UFO occupants.
aliens. And then later, Crowley identified Lamb in his writings as the representative of Satan, the devil, Lucifer, and Horus. And so we have H.P. Lovecraft, who channeled through dreams the Book of the Dead, the Necronomicon, where he discusses these ancient old ones that are coming from the bottomless pit. And then we have guys like Kenneth Grant and Aleister Crowley who are referring to these spiritual entities that they channeled. Uh, they're also calling them the Great Old Ones. So who are these Great Old Ones? Let's just take a look. Here is a couple of examples of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's Great Old Ones. Here you can see the ne Necronomicon that traces all the way back to 1571 and Dr. John D., the Book of the Dead. And when you look in the book, there are all types of spells and witchcraft. Here is a six-pointed star inside of a circle that's used to raise the dead and to raise these creatures. Now, I want you to keep it in context with what Howard Pittman said when he experienced the second heaven. He said there was all types of humanoid creatures, different orders and ranks of demons, some of them that had similarities to animals on planet earth like this creature here these are all images from the book of the dead and what do you see every single one of them kind of looks like a human being it's got an arm like a man a chest like a man this one has an arm like a human being or this one here has arms like a human being same thing even this creature here has regular arms and then we see you know wings and tails and all types of horrifying demonic entities that Howard Pittman said, when you see these things in real life, when you're in the second heaven and you see them, they're the most filthy, disgusting, morbid looking creatures that can almost ter terrify you and bring you to the place of nausea. Look at how some of these creatures sort of have these serpent looking tails, like what we described in Revelation 9. These are all creatures that come from the book of the dead, which come from the bottomless pit. Now, H.P. Lovecraft started this mytho mythological cult called the Call of Khufu. Now, that's a fictional cosmic entity that was created by H.P. Lovecraft. He, had a, he kept having recurrent dreams about this spiritual entity. Now, you may say that's just imaginary, but if you watch some of the Days of Noah um, lectures in the past, these guys that are into the occult, they have lucid dreaming where they have out-of-body experiences in a dream state and they're taken to literal places where they see literal entities. And it's, super, it's a supernatural spiritual phenomenon. And then later they document what they saw and people interpret it as imagination. I would submit to you that it is not imaginary, but it's based on fact. And he first introduced this into American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. Remember, the early 1900s was the rebirth of occultism in the world. Now, Cthulhu is considered a great old one. And he's depicted as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists. He's in the shape of an octopus or a dragon. And he's the caricature of a human form. Notice the color. It's that same reptilian green color that we've looked at in the past. And we're going to look at that in the next lecture when we go into the study on wormwood and absinthe and gall. But you'll see the same, the same colors here, just like you see with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the pale horse is really chloros. It's a chlorophyll color. And we'll get into that on the next lecture. But for now, Lovecraft referred to these entities that he was having these dreams of as old ones, or ancient ones, or the elder gods, bearing many names in themselves with different groups, as if associated with elements and yet transcending them. They have water beings hidden in the depth, those of the air that are the primal lurkers beyond time, those of earth, horrible animate survivors of distant eons. See, all of Lovecraft's stories talk about how these entities once ruled the earth and ruled the world and then somehow they lost their ruling and are now in this timeless primordial place lurking around waiting to come back 
Lovecraft's influence also extended into gaming literature. Game companies like TSR included an entire chapter of this mythos in the very first printing of Dungeons and Dragons, and the name of the source book was called Deities and Demigods. Now, I've already made it quite clear what a demigod is. A demigod is a half-human, half-immortal, and it's just a knockoff of the Genesis 6 fallen angel demonic contamination. H.P. Lovecraft created a number of deities throughout the course of his career, including all of the great old ones, who were ancient, powerful deities from space or a higher dimension who once ruled the earth and who have since fallen into a death-like sleep but are waiting to be awakened to return. Hmm. Notice what these entities look like. They have wings. They have octopus-looking heads. They're dragon-like with human arms. These are some of these demonic Nephilim species that we've been looking at. So we're going to conclude the lecture with this slide. This is a passage directly from the Necronomicon. This is a demonically charged and channeled grimoire, magical textbook called the Book of the Dead, in reference to the ancient old ones who come from the bottomless pit. This is H.P. Lovecraft's words. Nor is it to be thought that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. He's saying that man is not the first one here. There's other entities that have been here before, and man is not the last one on Earth either. There's other ones coming back. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Notice how that designates the past, the present, and the future. Not in the spaces that we know, but between them. They walk, serene and primal, undimensioned and to us unseen. See, he's talking about these disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that are currently present in the unseen dimensions torturing mankind, just as the Book of Enoch says. It goes on to say that Yog sothoth knows the gate. This is one of these ancient ones. Yog sothoth is the gate. Yog sothoth is the key and the guardian of the gate. Past, present, and future are all in one in Yog sothoth He knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they shall break through again. He knows where they had trod earth's fields and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them. See, they're awful. They're foul, unclean. That's what a foul, unclean entity smells like. Sulfur, it's unclean. But of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those that they have begotten on mankind. See that there? They have the features of who they have begotten. That is mankind. And of those are there many sorts differing in likeness from man's truest eidolon to that shape without sight or substance, which is them. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind givers with their voices and the earth mutters with their consciousness. That's exactly right, that even today, thousands of years later, humanity still has this consciousness, this genetic consciousness and imprint of the pre-flood Nephilim that still exists within the human psyche. That's why we see it all around the planet. That's why we see it all throughout the mythos and the legends of history and even throughout Hollywood. These ancient old ones, they bend the forest and they crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Kadeth in the cold waste have known them, and what man knows Kadeth? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereupon their seal is engraven. But who has seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower? Now he's talking about the infamous city of Atlantis, the sunken island within the ocean that holds the stones 
where these ancient ones' graves were sealed. If you study the mythological city of Atlantis, it's a city where these godmen, this ancient race of divine godmen, ruled the earth before the great and mighty flood conquered them. That is mythology of Noah's flood destroying the Nephilim. And that's where their seal, that's where their graves were sealed. But who has seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin. Yet can he spy them only dimly? La Shub Nigarath. Nigarath, Nigarath. That's the black goat satyr known as the god Pan. I looked up that word, and it's in reference to the goat, half-human, half-goat pan. That's a hybrid. As a foulness shall you know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet you see them not. See, they're in the spirit realm. They're right there trying to get us to turn to the dark side. And their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yog sohoth is the key to the gate, whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now where they could, where they ruled once. They used to be on the planet Earth. They once ruled, but now we rule. They shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer, they wait patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. That is a pretty wild excerpt that comes from a magical grimoire that was demonically inspired and channeled from H.P. Lovecraft in the 1920s, known as the Book of the Dead, which is used to summon half-human, half-hybrid creatures that come from the bottomless pit. So I realize that these videos are pretty crazy. We're talking about all this supernatural demonic stuff, but just like Howard Pittman said, even the best of Christians sometimes doubt that this spirit realm is real Satan is real, the scripture is real, the fallen angels and the Nephilim are real. And as you've seen, as I think we've clearly demonstrated in this lecture, there is a serious supernatural demonic manifestation that's going to take place in the last days. Now, I don't profess to fully understand the entirety of it, and I can't be sure that all of my um, interpretations of scripture are completely accurate. But nonetheless, uh, you can see that there seems to be this consistent thread throughout humanity and throughout these occultists and throughout these concepts. And so I just want you to be familiar with that information. And so on that speed, or on that note, God bless, God speed, and we'll see you on the next.